So if we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I first walked through the walls of a church a little bit over 30 years ago. And there were people in that place that were there to welcome me. They, they had prepared. They had planned. They were looking for people who would walk in and they would love on them because they were mature believers. They understood the importance of kingdom building. And they wanted to, as we have as our subtitle for the series, Arise and Build, but building a legacy for future generations. They were ready to do that. And I believe that's the season that we find ourselves in here at Journey Church as well. He's brought you here to make a difference. He's brought you here so that you could touch the lives of those who will come after us. Why don't we pray and we'll get into God's word today. Father, we thank you and praise you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you yet again into this place to have your will and your way in our hearts and our minds. Would you do the work that only you could do as you give us eyes to see ears to hear, and most importantly, the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. I think Pastor Adam's done a great job of capturing the major essence of Scripture in this series. It's not just about biblical truths. It's okay to understand biblical truths. It's very important that we do. But the Bible is more about application and transformation than it is about information, right? God comes in and that day some 30 years ago, my life began to be transformed. I walked in there living for the world and I encountered God in that place and something began to change in my heart that shifted my priorities and it hasn't been a fad, it hasn't been a phase, it's lasted over 30 years. The original version of the vision statement for this church was our hope is to see the city of Jacksonville transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Lovingly, Pastor Adam and the current staff have expanded that, and I love every aspect of it. They've, they've changed it just slightly to say our hope is to see the city, our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. They've expanded that vision and taken it even to another level. But I want to talk to you today about loving our city as part of this Arise and Build campaign. Is it even biblical to love our city? We'll explore that for, for just a moment today. But I, I think when we talk about loving our city, it's equally important that we're talking about loving the people of our city, right? The people who were out there, the lost, the hurting, the people who were like me when I walked into that door, who, had, who were the furthest, furthest thing from Jesus, who came in and encountered a group of people who are ready to love on them, care for them, and build for the future generations. I want to break that statement down just a little bit. I love doing this because whether you're here for the first time and you're hearing this for the first time or it's a reminder, we all need to be reminded of what God has called us to as a community of believers. What is the task that is before us? And it starts with our hope, right? We have to have a hope in this dark world that we live in, right? Jesus ultimately is our hope. Proverbs 19.1 says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purposes will prevail. If we're to arise and build and we do it on our own, guess what? It's going to amount to nothing, right? All of it will pass away. Another thing Pastor Adam does an incredible job with is telling us to pray first, right? Seek God first. And then align our lives with his plans because when we do, we shall see success. Jesus is our hope. Our hope is grounded and founded in the fact that the Lord is king of the universe. And guess what? He is king over this city as well, right? He's where we are to put our hope. Jeremiah 17, 7. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted by a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. May we put him first. May we be about his business. If we walk in him, we can have confidence that he will bless it because it is his work. Now, Journey Church has spent the past 15 years digging deep roots into this community. 
We've tried to build. We've tried to go deep. We've tried to be a lighthouse of hope. And man, I pray for the next 15 years and the 15 years after that, that God will only continue to expand the influence of this great body of believers, right? We live in a great city and there's a great work before us. And it starts with each of us. You and I are called to give out some juicy fruit from our lives. How many of you like that juicy fruit gum? Anybody old enough to remember juicy? They still eat juicy fruit gum? Yeah. See, the problem with gum today is like you eat it and it loses all of its flavor with like in a minute and a half. My wife gets so mad at me sometimes, man, I'll pop one of those gums in my mouth and like we get about two blocks down the road and I want to go throw it out the window. And she's like, how are you already done with that? Because that's synthetic stuff, right? It isn't the good juicy fruit, man. You eat some juicy fruit and it'll satisfy your cravings. It'll satisfy your needs. When you taste the real, it says, come taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? Once you taste the real and you see that real fruit being born in your life, people can't help but desire what you have. It says our hope is to see our cities transformed, right? A friend of mine once said rather sarcastically that every pastor has this same vision statement. Every pastor, I think, does well up when they get started and they're like, man, I want to transform my city. This is going to be awesome. We're going to cast this huge vision. And to an extent, sadly, he's right. Because when we look at our cities, they seem to be degrading more than they are getting better and better and better in our generation, right? There's churches on almost every corner in Jacksonville, yet things seem to be getting sadder and sadder. But I'm not going to be disappointed because the Bible says the kingdom of God is on a forceful advance. And though the devil may get some momentary victories, I know ultimately the king of king and lord of lords is the lord over this city. And we are going to see some great victories. We are going to see some lives change, some lives transform. But being a bit older as well, I am not arrogant enough to believe that one church is going to do it alone. It's not going to happen. That's why we still believe in planting churches. You know, last night, uh, Brinson was here a couple weeks ago. He's a great friend of the church. And we had a chance to go last night and be a part of his first launch service up on the north side near Jacksonville, uh, you know, the airport over there. What a blessing it was. There was a few hundred people that came out. And that's what it's about, planting a new seed and a new work and a new part of our city. And then all of us starting to work together to see our city truly transformed by the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Although my friend was a little like Job's friends at times, I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep asking God for revival. We're going to arise and build in our generation. Amen. I preached a few weeks ago that revival starts in us, that as we're changed, as we repent, as we seek God, each of us gets changed and transformed and then that starts to become contagious and one day we can see our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. It begs the question as the next part of our vision statement is by the power of the gospel. We're not going to do it in our power, right? If we try to do it in our power, it will not succeed. If we try to do it for our glory, it will not succeed. What is the gospel? It's this truth that God is the creator of heaven and earth. We are created beings that were created to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, but we fell in sin. Sin abounds in our world today, but God did not leave us without a rescue plan. He sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a sinner's death on the cross that you and I might be saved. That by his blood, we can be forgiven of our sins. You don't seem like you believe in that today here. I don't think you're very excited about that today. God saved you. He saved you. He died that you might have life and have life abundantly, that you could walk in freedom and then in turn share that freedom with other people. Our hope is that if we can surrender our life to him, we will be forgiven, we will be saved, and we will have the opportunity to spend eternal life with him. We'll be transformed in this life and into the next. The next part of the statement says, for the glory of God, why are we doing this? 
I hinted at it earlier, it can't be for our glory journey, church. It can't be to build the biggest church. It can't be so that we could look good. It can't be, you know, our ministry. This isn't Eric's church. This isn't Adam's church. It's Jesus' church. And if we get that backwards, man, we are going to be in trouble real quick, right? It's about the king. Genesis 126 says, we are created and formed in the image of God. You and I were created to reflect God's glory to a lost and hurting generation, to a generation that's destined to spend an eternity apart from God if people like you and I don't get out there and share the good news of the gospel. See, the Bible calls us ambassadors. We're talking about city taking today. We're talking about believing God to see our city transformed. I want to build on that concept in just a moment. But you are called to be an ambassador. What does that mean? You are a foreign agent in the midst of this city. You are not of this world once you get saved. You're part of another kingdom, but you're called to represent that kingdom here on earth. We need to think about that. We need to operate in that capacity. We need to walk that out. That's part of the calling on your life. Everyone looks at you because you claim the name of Jesus. They want to see if that is true. Finally, in our generation, our hope is to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Adam subtitled the series, Building a Legacy for Future Generations. I've often said, the gospel is only as good as the next generation. What do I mean by that? If we don't do our job of passing it on, it could die on our watch. I pray that you are a people that say, not on my watch. I'm going to share. I'm going to go out there and make a difference. I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to meet people. I'm going to do things that wouldn't seem natural to me. But man, I'm going to allow God to work through me to make a difference. You know, a number of years ago, we listened to some statistics, and maybe COVID reinforced this a little bit, but they said, you know, when a guest comes into church, if you're a guest today, they said one of the things that they fear is when you go around and you say, hey, now's the time to go shake everybody's hand. COVID kind of did away with that for a moment, right? But one of the biggest fears is like, I don't know any of these people. They're crazy. They look a little bit weird. There's something wrong with these people. I want to just sit here and be anonymous and hide in the background. But guess what? If you're to reach people, you need to get out of your comfort zone. I remember when we led our first small group, I was Eric, the introvert, still am to a large degree. I did not want to talk to people. I would go grab one of the little cards that we made. I'd be like, hey, Will, would you show up in my small group? Oh, I didn't wait for the answer, man. I was already gone. I was out of there. I didn't wait to see if he said yes or no. But that was how I started to break the ice to change and be transformed. So, hey, right now, why don't you get up, give somebody a high five, a handshake, or a hug if you know them a little bit. Come on, get a little bit uncomfortable. Get up for just a moment. High five, handshake, hug. You can do this. You got it. See, Journey Church, you got to get out of your comfort zone. There's people out there in our city you got to love. All right, enough of that stuff. It's time to sit down. Not too much. We don't want to overwhelm people. We want to let them know we love them. You didn't die. You didn't freak out. You're okay. You made it. You said hello to somebody you didn't know. Hallelujah, Jesus. In our generation, we can't pass the buck. We can't say, I'm nervous. I don't like to meet new people. It scares me. People are destined to an eternity in hell if we don't get out of our comfort zones and go out there and start to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. We can't claim it's the pastor's job to do. We can't claim it's somebody else's job to do. No, it's all of our jobs. Would we be a people who say, not on my watch? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Is it biblical to love a city? First off, let me say there are no accidents in God. He brought you here on purpose for a reason. You're here today that he might empower you 
to be an ambassador for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Luke 19.41, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. You know, I, I had the, the amazing privilege of being at the place where this particular verse was said to have happened and you're standing over the city of Jerusalem, this beautiful ancient city, you see it bustling with all the people and the cars going by and certainly there wasn't cars going by back then. But Jesus gazed upon that city and its people and he started crying and weeping. It's like, oh my gosh, these people are so lost. He was there to bring them a message of hope. He was bringing them a message of love and forgiveness and He's crying because people are going about their everyday lives and living for the things of the world and they don't even know it. They didn't encounter him yet. He was not alone in that. You look at Nehemiah and when Nehemiah goes and he encounters a conversation or he has a conversation with one of his his brothers and he tells them of the state of the city and the lack of the walls and the damage that's there, his first response is to begin to weep. Would God put that same kind of thing on our heart for our city and our nation and our people as we look at things and see them falling in disarray? Would we not look for political solutions? Would we not look for, um, you know, talking bad about whatever's going on? But would we start to act? Would we arise? Would we build? Would we live differently? Would we love differently? Would we go out there and share the gospel with the hope that people would be transformed, that in turn, those transformed people would transform other transformed people, and that we would see our cities bringing glory to God in the highest because he is the king of kings and Lord over our cities. May he receive what he is due. Hallelujah. Jesus. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. May the Lord instill something in you where you would fast and pray and believe God for our city. You know, I walked into those doors 30 years ago and the furthest thing in life was ministry. That was not something that I ever thought of, but very early on, and I pray that maybe God's stirring that in some of the hearts of some of you who are here today, I began to sense something different that I wanted to go into ministry. It was just weird. It was not my life direction or the things that I had anticipated where where we would be heading in our life. And, you know, we walked through those doors and all of a sudden God began to stir something. And then we ended up having this life change where I thought I was coming here to Jacksonville to get a job and we left the church behind, we left our family behind and it was a very weird initial stage in our life, right? We came to this city we didn't know and all I really knew about Jacksonville is it was the smelly city that we would drive through on our way to North Carolina when we go on vacation. (laughs) Back then they had all these paper mills that were here and the city literally stank back then. Come on Jesus. It had this weird smell. And then like my parents were like, why are you going to that smelly city that are like, the, they'll be here second service. It'll be great to see them. But uh, I didn't know anything about it, but we got here and God quickly started to do a work in my heart. I was working downtown Jacksonville and I had an office that overlooked the city and the garage that was there. I would always park on the top of the garage and I would get out of my car and I would begin to pray over the city. Yes. I would stand out there and just pray, Lord, I don't know why you brought me here but man, I'm going to pray for this city. And before you know it, he gave me a love, not just for the city of Jacksonville, but even in particular for Clay County. Like I just couldn't get it. Man, I want to make a difference. I need to plug in. I need to learn. I need to figure out more about this city. What's going on? How can I make a difference? Lord, would you use me to make a difference? My wife didn't like it, but one of the things I did was decorate my office with the maps of Clay County, the current and future maps. You know what a good decorator my wife is and all the stuff she does, she loves it. I'll be putting maps up in my office. She'd be like, what is wrong with you? But man, I would sit in my office and pray over it. And I would look at it. And back in the day, we're seeing some of these things come to fruition now. But in Clay County, uh, you see all the construction of what's the outer beltway, right? I would look at there and say, you know what? In the long run, you know where churches ultimately need to be? And maybe I'm speaking prophetically. We need to be near where the Outer Beltway and things are. Maybe a campus or some other thing. Because that's where the growth in Clay County and the city is going to happen in the days ahead, right? 
We need to plan for that. Lord, would you help us see? Would you help us understand what are you doing here? Who are the people that came before us? And how can we impact the generations that come after us? I began to plug in. God would give us connections and ideas that we could help in the community. I remember the first day I met Patrick. We had this dream. We said, we want to see a dream center-like concept, a city rescue mission-like concept pop up in Clay County. He happened to be the director of the city rescue mission in Jacksonville. So me and this other guy, Andre, we go up there, and somehow he gave us a meeting. I don't know why he gave us a meeting. But we started meeting with Patrick, and we're like, man, we have this dream. This is like 15 years ago. There was nothing that was even going on. We're like, we have this dream. We want to see something happen. And then Patrick ends up retiring and then somehow comes back to work, and now he's actually the one who's leading that dream and building Mercy Support Services in Jacksonville, Florida, Ermine and Clay County because of that God encounter that happened that day. And all it was was me like trying to, Lord, what are you doing here? Like, and he could use you in those crazy ways. He used all of us in those crazy ways. He's taken that baton. He's running with it. He's doing more things than we could have ever hoped for or dreamed for or imagined. God's got a calling on his life. In fact, other things I did, like I plugged into Clay County Chamber of Commerce about 15 years ago. I went out there and started plugging in. I started hanging out. I started meeting business people. And then even today, 15 years later, this week is the state of the county address. It's the largest gathering that the Clay County Chamber does. They invited us to go be the people who go do the invocation and be there to pray over the city, pray over its leaders. Patrick actually was the first nonprofit leader of the Clay County Chamber of Commerce running the board of directors a couple of years ago. God's giving believers influence in positions that matter. He wants to use people like you to do that. I'm getting too old to do that. Patrick's going to retire one day. Dina's going to take over in Jesus' name. She's hiding in the back over there. But one day she's going to take over and continue that legacy. Our work is almost done. These guys are the ones who are going to continue that on. We need to keep building for that next generation. We need to keep sowing. We need to help keep them growing. We need to arise and build. Hallelujah. But guess what? Your work is never done. I had the privilege of helping officiate Miss Carol's uh, going home service with John and Carolyn. And there was a young lady that was sitting right back there that day. And we asked them to get up there and take the mic. She took the mic because she wanted to share about the impact that John's wife had had in her life. And she said, John and Carolyn would go in there to Cracker Barrel faithfully, I don't know how many days a week, but they they would go in there and they would love on them. They were the furthest people from God. And she says the biggest thing that she ever told her, and she broke down and started crying, was Miss Carol said that she was going to pray over them on a regular basis. And that touched that young girl so much. I say these things because I want you to start to look for those areas in your life where you can make a difference. Maybe it starts for you by going to Cracker Barrel or your favorite restaurant and starting to build the relationship with that waitress. Maybe for you, you're out there on the soccer fields, places that we're not, and you could use your godly influence to touch people out on those fields. Maybe for you, you're a business person and you plug into the Chamber of Commerce and you do that. Maybe you have a heart for unwed mothers or women who um, are pregnant that don't have an abortion, you could go serve with First Coast Women's Services. Maybe there's people who you want to see not fall into homelessness and you could plug in with Patrick, his wife, and Dina and others who are here and go serve at Mercy Support Services. Maybe you could go out with the group Journey Out that's here on Saturday mornings once a month who was here yesterday that are going and feeding people right in our own parking lot, Right? But what I'm challenging you to do is get out of yourself and go out there and live your life to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' name. Guess what? It's not all about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about his glory. But God brought you here to make a difference, to arise and build in our generation. Eric, that's all good for you, but what can I do? 
I've already hinted at a few of those things, but I want to leave you with three practical things before we close. Before you go, pick up your kids. If you have kids in kids' church and go in there and plug into a small group because that's what y'all are going to do next, right? Come on. Don't run out of here today. Ambassadors. I talked to you about being ambassadors. So what are a couple of ways in which you can be ambassadors for Christ? The first one, in the spirit of what Adam says, pray first. God calls us to be watchmen on the walls of our city. Isaiah 62, 6, might be 60, or no, 6, 62, 6. O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night, continually take no rest. All you who pray to the Lord, give the Lord no rest until he completes his work, until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. Would you pray for our city? Would you take some of your time in your prayer closet to believe God to work in this city? Maybe it starts in your own neighborhood. Lord, in my neighborhood, I used to walk the streets in Eagle Harbor and I would go through there and I would pass by each house and I would say, Lord, I pray for these people. Lord, I know some of these people. I know that they're having trouble in their marriage right now. Would you heal their marriage in Jesus' name? I know people in this house and they're sick. Lord, would you bring healing to them right now in Jesus' name? I know this particular house, their kids are out there and they're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Lord, would you bring them home? Would you bring those prodigals home? Lord, would you touch the people in our city? Lord, would you do the work that only you could do? Get out there and walk your neighborhood. Go join Will at Streetside Prayer on 103rd. Go out there and pray for people as they're going down that street. You know, 103rd, they got like shot timers up there and stuff, like where if you shoot a gun, it'll detect where you're at. We don't need that kind of stuff in our city. We need God to go in there by the power of the gospel to change that circumstance and that situation where I pray that we don't need those kind of things anymore. You know, there's stories of revival of old that I don't want to be stories of old that I want to see part of our story. You know, there's stories of revival that would happen that they'd have to shut the bars down in the city because they didn't have no clients no more because everybody was saved and they didn't want to go up to the bar no more. How crazy is that? Why can't we believe for some of that stuff in our generation? Has the devil lied to you so much to make you believe that you don't have no influence? Arise and build in your neighborhood. Pray, ask God to give you a work that only you can do. Brings me to number two, arise and go. Find that place in the community where you could be involved. Use the gifts that God has given you to make a difference. What's that unique thing that you love to do? I bet there's other people that love to do it too. There was a famous book, the last one is small groups. Get involved in a small group as a participant and a leader. One of the one small groups that was the most impactful to the book that was one of the most impactful to me was called Fly Fishing, Dog Training and Sharing Christ. (laughs) Sounds crazy, don't it? But I picked up that book and it became the most influential thing for me in terms of small groups of every other book that I'd ever read, right? What was the premise behind it? This one pastor was having trouble getting people plugged into small groups. They had the traditional Bible studies. They were doing everything they can, and they would only get a fraction of people that would ever go plug into a group and start to go. So there was this older gentleman in the church that began to connect with his son, and his son was having all kinds of problems connecting. And the older gentleman said, hey, There's a couple of us that are going out and we're going to go fly fishing on Saturday. Is it okay if your son comes along with us? Sure. What he did is while he was fly fishing, he was sharing Christ with that pastor's son. He's like, this is strange. That same week as he tells it in the book, some other lady comes up to him and is like, I can't find my place in ministry. I can't sing. Um, I'm I'm not that great with kids. Um, I just don't feel like I've got a place. I feel really awkward. He says, well, what do you like to do? And he goes, well, one of the passions in my life is training dogs. He goes, why don't we do this? I'm going to actually pay for an advertisement for you to go out there into the park. And you're going to go out there and advertise free dog training. She went out there and advertised free dog training and all these people started coming, but she would open up the group in prayer. 
She would say, hey, we got, why are you doing this? Why are you doing free dog training? Because I love Jesus Christ. He's given me a passion for dogs and I use it as my means of connecting with people. He said she ended up getting like 50 people that came to the church and getting saved through her dog training ministry. Where else would that young man necessarily have connected with that older gentleman from a different generation where he could have a discipleship, you know, relationship with him building that next generation? And they connected through something different like fly fishing, but it ultimately made that opportunity to make disciples of others, right? So that's why we have what we call like free market small groups here at Journey Church. And here's kind of the challenge. One, if you've not been in a group, the challenge today to is attend a group. The first thing you should do is plug in, become a part of a group. But the next thing I want to say is I'm believing God, Jacob doesn't know this, so you better start to prepare, that next semester we're going to have double the number of groups, not just for numbers sake, but because we're going to open up the door where you are here, you're called to build, you're not called to just be a part of. You're called to lead. And one of the best places to start leading in a small context is through a small group. So I want you to attend one now. And what I want you to do is come alongside whoever is leading that group that you're attending and say, you know, Pastor Eric preached and one day I got to step out in faith and start dreaming about what small group you're going to lead. Maybe you're going to lead a dog training group because there's some dogs that need it around here. Maybe you're going to lead a deep Bible study. Maybe you're going to lead some other connection or mentoring type of group. But if we're to build, if we're to make a difference, if we're to go change it, it's not going to just happen in this building or whatever one God may give us. We need little lighthouses of the gospel all throughout our city and all throughout our neighborhoods and all over the place. And those little gospel lighthouses are your houses. You know, Scripture actually says that you are a light on a hill, a city on a hill that cannot be shaken. Oh, there it is. They got it. Well, they got it up there somewhere, but I can see it back there. You are the light of the world. It says Jesus is the light of the world, but then he changes it and says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, that lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. God wants to use you as a candle out there in our city that would be a burning torch, that would be the gospel emanating from you, going out to everyone that you encounter in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your place of hobby, wherever you find yourself, God wants you to arise and build and make a difference in the lives of the next generation. I pray that you would respond to that today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. God's called you to it. Would you rise from your seats today? Lord, we thank you and we praise you today. In the book of Philippians, Paul describes himself as a citizen of heaven and then later as an ambassador for Christ. Makes sense because as we said earlier, an ambassador represents their home country in a foreign land. You and I were not created for this fallen world We were not created to live in sin. We were created to be a part of the family of God. The Bible tells us that no matter how old we are, no matter how young we are, or how far away we feel from God, that he's awaiting us with open arms, ready to take you home. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, man, what a wonderful opportunity to do that today. Before you can be an ambassador, you first have to be a follower. And man, if you've never done that, I pray God would meet you right here, right now in this place. Maybe you are a believer in Jesus Christ, but you've strayed away and today God's stirring something in your heart. Maybe some dreams that seemingly have been dead for a long time. And God's rejuvenating those in your heart this very moment. There's nothing wrong with rededicating your heart to Jesus and saying right here, right now, this very moment, from this day forward, I will live for you with all my heart, strength, soul, and mind. God, you are my king. You're Lord over this city, but more important, you are Lord over me. 
If that's you today and you need to dedicate or rededicate your heart to Jesus, would you do me a big favor? I'd love to pray for you. Would you raise your hand right where you're at and I'll pray for you today. Is there anybody here today need to dedicate or rededicate your heart to Christ?